Good morning, everyone. My name is Shripad, and uh, I um, I'm from Pfizer. Uh, I'm just up up the road, uh, not too far from uh, LGI. And uh, up there, my job, or my day job, is I oversee um, the image analysis group. So we do a lot of histopathology image analysis for the Pfizer portfolio. Um, so we look at all kinds of uh, histopathology data, bright field, H and E's, IHC, special stains, and again, multiplexing. Multiplex data is kind of my favorite type of data set. And um, most of you know, we have a, a workshop that follows uh, the KeyPath workshop and that's focused on multiplex image analysis. So since that's all about multiplexing, so I thought maybe the technical validation should be on the bright field and the non uh, fluorescence data sets part. So uh, what I want to do today is, oh, sorry. So I need to give a disclosure. So I'm an employee and, uh, uh, yeah, all animal procedures were approved uh, and everything was done basically, you know, um, following, you know, very strict uh, regulations that's uh, laid out in, you know, in my company. All right. So um, what I want to do today um, is um, give a little bit of a, a slightly different perspective for what we mean by validation and what we, uh, what, what I would like to sort of uh, really sort of motivate and have a few take home messages for the audience here today, you know, in terms of technical validation. And again, uh, since this has been a QPAT workshop where we've been, you know, uh, you guys have been sort of immersed in all kinds of algorithms and workflows. Um, uh, when you think of validation, you think of validating the algorithm, which I think is very important, uh, but there's more to just validating the algorithm, but it's also important to understand what, um, what even validation means and how you define it and, and how you, uh, uh, spec it. So th those are some you know areas that we will cover, uh, and at least that's the the motivation that uh, that I have today to uh, to convey to you all. Okay. So really, what is validation? So I mean, I actually looked it up in the the Webster dictionary uh, uh, since I'm giving a talk on that. Uh, so it says the act of making or declaring an assay or an, or, or something as acceptable. Well, in this case, that something is either the underlying assay that you've developed or the algorithm that you're trying to validate on the images that were generated using a particular assay. Okay. Or you could say the action of checking or proving the accuracy of something, right? So, um, so this actually introduces two new words. One is what is acceptable. What is how do you define accuracy? Well, um, what's acceptable? As you'll see, acceptability is is very subjective. It really depends on what you're trying to actually you know achieve with that particular algorithm or assay. Okay. Uh, on the same note, how do you define accuracy? Something that's accurate, um, I mean, it could be within 1%. That's considered accurate. Uh, that's fairly accurate. But for many things, you don't need that level of accuracy. Uh, you can be within 10% of the true value, and you're still considered accurate. That's good enough, right? So again, the question is, what, what, how do you define accurate? So the first, uh, and, and also what's sort of uh, an overarching theme in this presentation will be that uh, validation is definitely you need to understand how good or not, you know, uh, good your algorithm or your assay is, but also it's very important to understand where your algorithm fails. Because if you don't know where it fails, then you're only sort of half as knowledgeable of using that algorithm. Excuse me. So really, um, first take home message right to the, you know, my first slide is uh, validation is very relative. Okay, so you, you have to define, and this is what makes validation the hardest part. Uh, and I can, probably give you like a, a bit of a farmer perspective to it. So when we see a lot of vendors come in and say, oh, we have validated our assay, we have validated the algorithm. That's a very subjective statement, right? And, and the same thing applies to you guys is that when you think of validation, you have to really think of it in the context of what it's being used for and whether it 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 it's it is reasonable and adequate to set your criteria for you know something being right uh, and acceptable. Okay, so before we sort of jump into too many things. Uh, I just want to sort of take a, a concrete example. So let's say I have um, um, an assay. This is basically a bright field image. You know, you the blue is a hematoxyl and counter stain, which stains nuclei. The brown is uh, basically a, a DAB, uh, which is a, a chromogen uh, that is used to um, visualize your, your, your um, biomarker, which, you know, you've basically labeled it with an antibody probe. Um, so in this case, this is a nuclear biomarker. You see different stains of uh, brown to really dark brown black, you know, uh, almost sort of a very dark appearing nuclei to, you know, 
to intermediate sort of shade, shades of brown to light brown. Okay, uh, so the sort of a very standard type of a clinical assay or a preclinical assay that we develop and we quantify. So really, I want to use this as a as an example to uh, motivate a few things uh, and first introduce a few concepts here because these are terminologies that you know we will sort of uh, sometimes loosely but also interchangeably use. Um, but at least we need to understand what it means. So sensitivity simply is a quite you know means you're trying to detect a change or the presence of a signal. Uh, when it is actually present in the sample, okay? So simply put, uh, the issue here is if you see basically, uh, and, and again, what you're seeing here is an assay, I'm not showing you the ground truth, uh, but assuming that this is the ground truth, the question is, is the assay, you know, appropriately reflecting what the ground truth, you know, bi biomarker expression is? So that's basically what we mean by sensitivity. Specificity is sort of the case where when you don't have a signal, your assay shouldn't say that there is a signal or your algorithm shouldn't pick something when it's not there. So it's more almost like how resilient is it to false positives? So ideally you want an algorithm to have the highest sensitivity and highest specificity. Now, the reality is that, you know, it's often it's a bit of a yin and a yang. You could have one, of course you can design algorithms that are there I and mean, that's, you know, uh, and, and there are ways in which you can characterize this, but the reality is that you kind of struggle with trying to get one over the other. And at the end of the day, it's a compromise and that's where trying to understand where an assay or an algorithm fails becomes important because you need to know sort of it's the, the, the where the guardrails, you know, when when and where you hit the guardrails. Okay, um, accuracy again is a term that is rather loosely used, but I can tell you for most uh, cases, uh, when it comes to IHC or some of the image analysis uh, algorithms that we use, accuracy is a very, very hard thing to define and quantify. Uh, so if somebody says, you know, um, can you define, you know, how accurate your algorithm is? The short answer is it's actually a very hard entity to define because simply put, what it means is, you know, how close you are to, you know, um, how close is your estimate to the true value? So you're basically saying your estimator is unbiased uh, and that has a very strong statistical connotation to it. So it's not very easy to define that for a lot of the things that we do here. But I just want to put that out there because uh, it's, you know, it's it's not straightforward to do it. And again, there are some practical, you know, issues as well uh, when, when you're trying to define accuracy. For example, in a cell segmentation ac uh, algorithm, uh, to truly define operator or algorithm accuracy, you need replicates. Sure, you can simulate your samples, but that's the best you can do. You can't really do that with a real sample because a histological section, there's no way you can get true replicates. You cut one section, you cut the next section, you've already missed a cell. So, uh, so th there are some practical difficulties with doing um, very robust accuracy calculations. Um, again, precision is, is 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 a measure that we oftentimes talk about, you know, in, in this area, uh, in this field. That simply is a measure of how close you are or how uh, close the replicate measurements are. So if you have a, a reproducibility study where, you know, you have technical replicates um, and you're asking the question, okay, how tight is basically your coefficient of variation of the CV, which is simply calculated by the ratio of standard to mean, uh, standard deviation to mean, and, and that's a, a measure that, you know, we see very widely used actually in this field. Um, the last thing I want to point out, and, and again, this goes back to the whole guardrail, knowing your guardrails things, is the lower limit of quantification or the LLQ. Um, this uh, it particularly applies for fluorescence assays because unlike bright field assays, which, you know, oftentimes a, a a well titrated and a well uh, designed assay will have almost no background, right? Uh, a fluorescence assay will always have background. You always have autofluorescence. You always have spurious, you know, signals. So LLQ simply is when you have this noise in your data. Um, sometimes you might have noise in special states. I mean, there are some rare instances, but in the interest of time, we're not talking about those. But LLQ simply means if you have, let's say, a, a duplex assay, which is what is the data that's shown here. I have FITSI and sci-fi positive objects. Um, and, you know, you have different control, you know, and treatment groups. Uh, and then you also have the isotype group right there. But the point of the isotype group, uh, control group, is that you, you, you really just get a background, you know, signal issue. And what you see is that when I ran my algorithm, uh, to detect these objects, I'm clearly picking up a lot of objects here, right? Uh, that's around 2%. That's that's the number. So I'm getting false positives, right? So that basically acts as my lower limit of quantification. So which means any number that I get below this 2% is not reliable, OK? 
Okay, so you need to know that at the outset. And most importantly, with solutions, you have to run the isotype control and do the quantification every time you do the ask. Because every time you run it, um, you know, there could be a different lot. You know, maybe you sort of overstained it, you underfixed it. There's lots of potential sources of error. So that's something that you always have to run uh, and keep that in mind. So th those are just some, some quick terminologies that I want to introduce. Okay. Sorry. Wouldn't those um, factors or caveats that you just mentioned about like fixation and things like that also apply to data scanning? It actually applies across the board. Yeah. Uh, so I think the issue again is that um, it absolutely it does. But the issue with fluorescence is with, with dab staining generally the way it works, and maybe that's a good segue into this. Um, so the good thing and the bad thing about bright field and DAB staining is that um, the bad thing is that it has very low dynamic range, okay? Uh, and and what that means, and, and we'll talk about that in a second, that's what this whole slide is about, uh, which is the thousand feet view of validation. Um, it's got a very low dynamic range, okay? And the reason why that low dynamic range comes, and this is sort of important, is because of the fact that the assay is enzymatic. Uh, you know, it uses an enzymatic reaction mechanism, right? So you have primary antibody, you have a polymer, which has HRP tag, um, you have an anti-primary and then which binds to the uh, the polymer HRP tag and then the HRP kicks off a chemical reaction. It's almost like a PCR that's running on your slide. It's just, it just amplifies the heck out of it and deposits DAB and then you just wash everything off, right? So the good thing is it's it's super sensitive, right? Have a little bit of antigen, you're gonna get a lot of signal. Um, that's also the bad thing because then it's not, it's very hard to titrate. I mean, you can titrate it, uh, but it, it really sort of poses a lot of challenges there. Okay. So to answer your question about, you know, um, uh, pre-analytic variables, you know, under fixation, over fixation, normally the way uh, an assay is titrated with IC is that um, to some extent it does depend on your samples too, but typically your negative control generally tends to be cleaner. Um, and therefore you, you seldom actually worry about, oh, I'm actually going to pick up a lot of, you know, false positive staining uh, with, because in, in, endogenously you don't have a DAV signal. Um, you know, in, in your data. So that's one thing uh, that you need to keep, that makes bright field analysis actually a little bit easier. And the second thing is even if you have it, it's because of the low, you know, dynamic range, you typically, typically don't pick it up, right? But with fluorescence, the problem is flu autofluorescence can be sometimes very strong. And that's where even if you do whatever you can, unless you literally, you know, burn your sample or, you know, sort of bleach the heck out of it, you know, it's, it's not going to go away. So it's more of a thing that, Permeates, whereas you know with bright field, it's you know it's because you're looking at brown, you, you're better off. You don't tend to deal with that that, that often. Okay, so with IHC assays, generally any enzymatic. I mean, this 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 is not HRP, but any enzymatic reaction. When I say anything enzymatic, this could also look. I mean, any amplification strategy. This could be termite signal amplification. This could be you know um, H probes. Uh, that also has an amplification strategy. Anytime you have a, an amplifier, you know, in your sample preparation assay, you generally tend to have a nonlinear response, okay? So this is sort of a textbook thing where we think that it's a sigmoidal response. And what I mean by that is, if you look at biomarker expression on the, and this is all just made up stuff, so this is not real data, but this is just, I'm trying to convey uh, a point here. So if you plot biomarker expression uh, versus the IHCV dot, the problem is you actually have, um, a fairly narrow, you know, dynamic range, which means it's really between this and this uh, is where you're seeing, you know, a titratable IHC signal readout, right? So if you now, and the problem is, unless you run your assay, you don't know how this curve looks like. And again, 99.999% of the time, nobody tries to recreate this curve. Okay? Everybody knows that this is what it behaves. And the holy grail of IHC assay, which is why this is very iterative and repetitive, is that you're trying to pick, again, you're literally trying to guess and pick samples for your assay that would be relatively low, medium, and high. This is a guessing game. So, and you do that blind, right? And to some extent, high, medium, and low for your biomarker is what you have. You now, what you have in your, you know, in your cell line, you know, freezer or whatever is available as, you know, already, uh, you know, known data. So, so to some extent, you don't have a lot of choice in picking your samples. But the problem that poses is that you just don't know where it falls on the sigmoid curve. So consequently, you might end up with, a, with an assay that does this where you see nothing, and then you see a very, very strong signal. So, so to address you know, the, the prior question is that this low dynamic range can really cause this problem. So in other words, um, 
you can have an assay that has very good sensitivity, but it doesn't have the ability to discriminate you know, different biomarker expressions. And believe me, and this might be the scary part for some of you in this audience, there are a lot of assays like this in the clinic where medical decisions are being made, okay? Uh, and again, again, it's, let me sort of preface this carefully. I'm not saying that we're, we're, uh, we're using wrong assays. The intent of those assays, this is where the validation comes in. The intent of those assays is simply to ask the question, is a biomarker present in the patient biopsy or not? It's not to quantify biomarkers. If it's there, it's bad news. If it's not there, it's good news, or vice versa. Right? So that's the intent of so 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 even assays of this kind have a value and purpose. And, and like I said, there are quite a few of those actually available. You know, type one assays, class one assays, they behave like this. Okay. Um, but of course, you know, we're talking of the, you know, we're doing quantitative image analysis, so we want to quantify everything. So really the the goal of assay development is you want to push your response to be much more linear, right? So this is where the titration aspect comes into picture. And then if I now pick the same samples, assuming, you know, I'm, I'm still using the same samples, but I've now titrated my assay, I basically end up with a little bit more types, more differentiation, right? So this is actually a very big, you know, aspect or, uh, you know, in, in, in the clinical world or in the preclinical world. So when we develop biomarkers, right, for, for targets, this is what, you know, the team spends a lot of time doing. Right? So why am I talking about uh, assays, you know, when we're talking about technical validation? Because a big part of algorithm validation is you first need to make sure that your assay is appropriate for the algorithm that you're using. That's why this is the thousand feet view, okay? So you need to make sure whatever assay you're doing is first of all, having a proper titratable response. If you don't, or if you're not sure, then a lot of the things that you're gonna do downstream, um, you know, may or may not actually hold water or may not be relevant at all. Okay? So that's just, so it's, it's very important to sort of always keep that in mind, how you generate the image uh, and, and what is sort of the, the overall response of your assay to the biomarker and what you're quantifying. It's something that you need to keep in mind. Okay? Uh, again, this is more, if you have an assay like this, this becomes a little bit more amenable for quantitation and things like that. But again, this is only the thousand feet view, right? So we need additional validation. Okay, so um, so before I sort of go too much into it, so one thing I want to just talk a little bit about is okay, so we'll go a little bit into technical validation per se. So how do you okay? So now that we have an assay in place, now we'll talk of algorithms. How do you quantify biomarker expression in an image? I mean, this applies to any kind of biomarker. It could be nuclear, nucleocytoplasmic, membrane, doesn't matter, right? There's broadly two ways in which you do it. One, you account for basically the intensity. Right, and there are actually clinical tests that just solely use intensity um, to make a diagnosis for a patient. Okay, so here the idea is that okay, I see strong staining. Oh, it's a three, but but it doesn't matter what proportion of cells are strong. So I could have ten percent cells, forty percent cells, or hundred percent cells all giving strong staining. That will be called a three plus. I could have intermediate staining. It doesn't matter what the proportion is. If it has intermediate staining, it's a two plus. Okay. You have weak staining, it's a one plus. I have no staining, that's a negative, okay? As you can see, the problem is you're not taking the proportion into account and that causes some issues. Now, for some applications, it's okay. But when you're truly trying to develop a, a, an algorithm to quantify biomarker expression, just looking at intensity, not good. It's not good enough. Um, the other way to do that is actually a proportion score, okay? Proportion scores are also used in the clinic. Uh, to 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 you know to diagnose patients. So here you're not really worrying about how intense the stain is. As long as you think it's positive, you know you basically come up with a positivity score and say, okay, what is the proportion of cells percent positive cells? So in that criteria, you see what you call this weak, moderate, and strong will all be clumped into one category as thirty percent positive. That is, these two things gets appropriately scored as sixty and hundred percent positive. Okay? Again, these are just some examples. I haven't literally counted the number of cells here. So just to illustrate the point that you you buck the same data you bucket it differently depending upon how you score for it. But I guess it's not a you know far thing to say that what you really need is to basically quantify both intensity and proportion because that gives you a much more comprehensive you know score of how much is expressed on a personal basis and how many cells also expressed, right? And that's where the, the classical eight score comes. An eight score is 
it's basically a histological score. That's where the, the letter H, you know, is really means. What it does is it actually looks at both the intensity and proportion. It's a weighted proportion score for um, heuristically, what you do is you take your samples, you bin these, these intensities as a three, a two, and a one, right? Why it's three? We'll talk about that in a second. It's an interesting anecdote. Uh, and then you basically look at a weighted sum. And why is it three times the number of three plus and two times? Again, historic reasons. The reason why you only have three and you don't have 10, 20, or 255, which by the way are the cradles, eight bit, is because of historic reasons. Think about it. The eight scores have been existing since this 80s. Okay? It was first attempted to do ER and PR scoring. Um, although they don't use eight score for ER and PR clinically. Um, so in the 80s, we didn't have digital slide scanning. We didn't have image analysis. We definitely didn't have QPAT. So it was all done using brass and glass. And if you think about it, your human eye is good at designing three levels or reproducibly design three levels. Remember, you're trying to teach this to all the pathologists to score, each, you know, ILC slides. So, so that's where the, num the three comes. And again, the three, two, one doesn't mean that three is three times the intensity or brightness of two and, and so on and so forth. That's not the intent. It was just a heuristic number. They said, okay, I'm just going to multiply by three because it just gives me a little bit more of a dynamic range. So technically this number will be go between zero and 300 because you can have all three plus cells, which means the highest value for an eight score is 300, or you could have no positive cells, which means you'll get a zero, right? And it's a continuous number between zero and three. So it just gives you the operational convenience. Okay. So those are sort of the basic things. Okay. So, um, so let's continue with this, this 100 feet view of things. So how do you actually do validation, technical validation of algorithms here? So again, the first thing you do is you again look at samples. Again, the same type of samples you use for validating NASA, you take those samples and then you say, okay, now I'm going to calculate the edge score. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about how you segment and how you validate the segmentation, but we're still sort of in the 100 feet view of things. So you take an algorithm that looks reasonably okay. I mean, this could even be you know, um, I mean, we've done this in QPath as well, but this, this specific data was not generated in QPath, but, you know, again, you know, you can just use the standard cell segmentation. Uh, QPath can calculate head scores. So you calculate it, you plot these things. And again, the two things you look for is you basically, you know, and you do this for multiple, you know, um, cores that are, you know, plated in, you know, across multiple slides, right? The cores basically have clearly varying levels of biomarker expression. Uh, and that's just plotted here in reverse for some reason. Um, but the key thing that you're looking for is, you know, you're looking at the CV of your data, right? Uh, because you want to have a CV that's fairly tight. And again, what's the, the golden rule of thumb is you generally look for CVs of less than 20%. Okay. Now, why 20%? Uh, I can only answer that question, you know, that question with another question is why is the P value always less than 0.05 significant? Same answer, right? So this is sort of an accepted sort of rule of thumb. In the histo you know, in the in the histology world, is that okay? Uh, histology assays, twenty percent CV less than that is generally considered to be okay. That's workroom. Okay, uh, it's good that if you have smaller CVs, that's great. It just means that your the reproduce your precision is better. Okay, so and normally if it goes above twenty percent, some cases that's con that that will be considered a fail, uh, and they'll go back to the drawing board and see okay, can we can we tighten things somewhere either with the assay or with the algorithm? So that's kind of where the rework actually happens. Um, the one other thing we generally look for, um, and I do have to be very careful when I say this, um, is mm -hmm. this is not something, this is not a requisite, but this is a nice to have. The linear response, and I'll give you examples where the response is not linear. What is concerning or what we don't like to see is, um, is a non-monotonic response. So in other words, as the biomarx expression increases, we want to see an increase in the algorithm output. Okay. Uh, and if it's linear, great. Uh, but sometimes it's not going to be linear. And, you know, and, and here it's a little bit concerning because it goes up and goes down, but really, you know, five should have more biomarker expression than four, at least on theory based on mRNA transcripts, it should have more. But uh, but given that it's so high, this is something, you know, we let it pass. But ideally, this, these are some characteristics we look for when we validate samples. Again, we're still sort of validating this at a fairly high level because we're saying, okay, here I have something that's nothing, low, medium, low, medium, high, and high. Am I actually able to reproduce, uh, you know, that with my quantitative metric? And the answer is yes. You know, I am able to reproduce this. Again, this is all sort of fairly, um, uh, uh, what I would consider to be sandbox, you know, samples where these are cores, uh, which are actually generated from cell pellets, uh, for which we know the, the biomarker expression. Okay, but again, 
uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, our sort of holy grail is to develop things for clinical samples. How does this actually work for clinical samples and how do you do that? It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. How do you know the biomarker expression? Well, you use an antibody-based assay, but that's exactly what we are validating. So, so how do you know what the ground truth is, right? That's a very big problem that we face in, in clinic or anytime you do biomarker assay development, right? Uh, oh, we can use Western blot, but how do you know the Western blot antibody is validated? So we go in the circular loop. So what we have found over the years is um, as much as mRNA is not a prediction of trans, uh, you know, of protein expression, it's still a good surrogate to, to make these types of population level predictions safe. I have extremely high mRNA levels versus extremely low mediocre levels. They should have some sort of proportional behavior. And surprisingly, we find this to hold up very well uh, for FFPE sections and you know, formalin fixed paraffin embedded sections. Uh, when we actually extract mRNA, mRNA from adjacent CO sections. Okay? So it actually holds up fairly well for most cases. Um, so this is sort of one way you know, by which we do the validation for an algorithm is to say, okay, um, I, I run the algorithm you know, on these samples using this particular assay, which I've now gained a certain level of confidence because you know, it's kind of behaving at least reasonably well with these toy samples. And then you know, when I correlate that against mRNA levels, I get a positive Spearman correlation. So it's suggesting that, you know, my algorithm sort of trailing. Again, it's still a hundred feet view, right? Because I'm not fully validated. Uh, I just had a quick question about one of your previous slides. So for the corollary validation with mRNA targets, how would you do that in say archival tissue that may have experienced say uh, RNA's contamination and can't rely on the you know, accurate RNA? Yeah, so uh, very good question. Um, so what we do is we don't only rely on this. So sometimes I do have a slide further down. So when we don't have reliable mRNA reads, what we do is um, we actually take the same data. We ask a pathologist to come up with a score. Um, actually, it's normally a consensus score. So you get two pathologists to read the same slide. You get a consensus eight score. And then we correlate that against the digital eight score. And I'll actually show you. So I do have a slide for that. So typically, we have two endpoints um, for this. So it's not always mRNA. I mean, I, uh, that's something we do frequently, but we also do pathologist consensus scoring, but that's a very good question. Uh, actually, the mRNA technology, um, the retrieval technology has improved considerably um, because you, up until a few years ago, the cutoff was five years. So anything older than five years, they couldn't do it. But now they have improved their assay where they're actually able to retrieve more quality mRNA. The only thing is you have to provide them multiple curves. You can't just get away with one adjacent serial section. So this is a bit of a misnomer here. Uh, and probably I should have said adjacent serial sections. You have to give them four to 10 calls. So more tissue you need to provide. And then their uh, retrieval is a little bit better. Uh, but still, it's a good surrogate estimate for uh, for getting biomarker abundance. So where does really the one feed view of validation take place? Um, I mean, it does take place, but it sort of takes place in a, in, a, in a little bit more of a sequential way. So here is where we start to look at sort of the details. Again, I'm, I'm glossing over this because I want to keep this high level and I'm you know, running a little bit short on time as well. Um, but the way we do this is this is this is probably the most painstaking part is to do the validation of the one feed view is to basically ask the question, am I actually segmenting segmenting my nuclei very accurately? Um, and the way we have done this is um, we actually go and do it the fairly painstaking way of annotating ground truth data. Uh, we run the algorithm on the ground truth data. We calculate what's the true positives and the fal false positives, both at the object level and at the pixel level. So the, the sensitivity measurements that we have here is actually pixel level measurements. So what I mean by pixel level measurements is that we basically take each object, annotate, uh, you know, convert these labels as ROIs, and then we ask the questions, you know, how much of the positively predicted, you know, um, uh, uh, the predictions are actually present in these individual ROIs. So that's my true positives. What falls outside is considered to be the, the false positives. Uh, and then we basically calculate sensitivity and specificity based on you know, those types of you know, pixel area measurements. You can also do this at the object level uh, where you're simply saying that, okay, if I get half the object, then I count it as positive. Um, that's not the best way to do it. That's kind of cheating a little bit because that's where you can actually, uh, uh, an algorithm can segment one nucleus as two, right? And if you don't actually count that carefully, you can basically get better predictions. Okay. Um, okay. So just moving on, and I do have a few more slides. I'll quickly go through. So this is so the the algorithm that we used here is classical machine learning algorithm. And again, the only point I want to make here is that 
this algorithm, when you have messy data, it doesn't really deliver. There are lots of places where it picks, it either mislabels it as positive or it just basically gives you a false positive. And when you use a deep learning segmentation algorithm, this is based on a classical unit, uh, you're actually you know, improving some of these, 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 you know, the, uh, the, the, the limitations that you have with an ML segmentation algorithm. From a technical standpoint, this is great. And yes, I mean, this has actually slightly better performance. This is all good. But the question that we often ask is, is this worth it? Right? What? Are, okay. This is not perfect. And this is better, but this is also not perfect. Okay. So this is an important question that we ask in validation, sort of a practical use case. When do you put that extra effort? Is the, is the, are we sort of in the territory of the law of diminishing returns, right? Where, uh, yeah, I'm going to do TL, but it's only pushing me three percent. Is that three percent worth it? How do you know that, right? So again, that's where having orthogonal data helps because now you can do the same type of analysis and ask the question: Okay, what happens if I? I mean, and this doesn't have to be MR, and this can also be pathology scores. Um, but the question is, where do you really see the benefit, right? And this is how we convince ourselves that the effort is worth it. Is that you basically look at you know the correlation of the eight score we calculate with the ML algorithm against mRNA versus the same you know when we do it with the TL algorithm. So you clearly see an improvement in the eight scores uh, in in in, in the payment correlation. So this correlates better. I mean, just qualitatively, you see that this is all getting clumped up here, right? And and here you just have much better discrimination in the data. So that's essentially what you know saying again uh, sort of goes back to one of the. Uh, the, the one of the things I think I mentioned early on is as much as it's important to understand how well your algorithm performs, it's also important to understand where it fails because that will actually help you um, please make more judicious choices when you have data, problematic data like this. Okay. Uh, I'll try to brush this up. Um, okay. So this is actually another example. I just want to quickly go over this where a failure, you know, of uh, in a technical validation actually led to, you know, uh, us developing a new metric. Uh, so this is an example. Actually, this is done in QPath where we were trying to segment the membrane. This is a membrane biomarker where we were segmenting it and we wanted to calculate the eight score. And one of the challenges we found was that this was not doing a good job. Uh, and partly the reason is because the staining is messy. Okay, membrane staining in FFP tissue is very, very messy. Okay, it's low resolution. Uh, DAB, you know, it doesn't just deposit nicely across, so the algorithm struggle. And again, this is the era of, you know, before Salvos or any of the deep learning algorithms we have here. Um, okay. And one of the things is this, we did this in 2017. It took us a while for us to, you know, get legal approval to publish this. But point is, we had issues. Um, and then again, as with everything else, we said, okay, fine, nothing is perfect. So let's just go ahead and do our validation. And what we found is we're actually getting fairly low spearman correlations, right? Whether we correlate that against mRNA or with eight score, you know, pathologist head score, as I just mentioned, because we said that, hey, mRNA can never be perfect. Why not just get a human being, let them score, and then let's look at the correlation. So digital eight score versus a human generated head score. Overall, things did not look good, okay? So this is why we ended up developing a new metric. Uh, and the whole idea here was, you know, this is also written up and published, but the idea is rather than score things at the cell-based level, you do it at the pixel-based level. So it's exactly the same idea. You take an image, you segment that, uh, the individual pixels detected as high, medium, and low, and negative, uh, and then you basically calculate a PIC score, uh, PIC 8 score based on the area of the high, medium, low, you know, positive pixels. Again, it behaves exactly like an 8 score. It takes values between 0 and 300. It gives you the intensity and proportion. So it's basically a nice handle you know, that you have as an equivalent of, you know, a regular head score, okay? And thanks to Sarah, she actually implemented, you know, this in QPath as well. So if you actually look at the forum, it should be available somewhere. Yeah, I wrote version one, Pete wrote version two, it's 10 times faster uses. Okay. Right oh yeah, <laughs> thank you, yes. Okay, um, so, but, but again, the proof of the pudding is actually in the correlation. So how does this actually look in practice? Same data set, uh, if you actually see how the PICS head score correlates, it actually correlates much better. Uh, but, but again, when I say much better, what also we did was we wanted to be sure that this number correlation, which is 0.88, is statistically higher or, or this difference in correlation is statistically significant. Okay, and that's what we are trying to show here is that if you compare this versus this, uh, which by the way, you know, uh, I kind of glossed over this uh, this part. We implemented the HALO, the eight score both in QPath and in HALO. Again, the rationale there was, hey, it's, it's an algorithm, right? I mean, the implementation of the algorithms are different. So we actually, we also did this in Visio Farm, but I'm not showing the data because 
I didn't have space to put all the data on the people. So yeah, we so what we did was when an algorithm failed, we said, okay, let's look at another software and another software because these algorithms are different. Maybe there's something you know fancy about one over the other, but it consistently failed, right? So that told us that this is fundamentally, you know, there are issues with this. So so that's that's where again, long and short of it is that um you 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 know, in an attempt to validate something, it failed and it actually led us to, you know, developing a, a completely new metric, which, you know, in the end provided us, you know, better handle in, in trying to characterize biomarker levels. Again, take home message, you know, you trust your al algorithm, but please always qualitatively and quantitatively verify whenever possible. Okay, so that's, I think that would be sort of an important thing. Um, I guess I'll just skip this again. This just shows how assay, you know, a low dynamic range assay versus a high dynamic range assay, what it actually means. So if you look at cl patient clinical samples, so this is a biomarker that's used for selection, patient selection. Um, and this is a low dynamic range assay, high dynamic range assay. Again, use the pixel rate score. Surprisingly, you get very good correlation here as well as here. Um, but the point is, um, if you look at the data, I guess there's a line that's missing here, um, is that the low dynamic range, the narrow dynamic range, just the red line actually uh, misses a lot of the, will misclassify a lot of these patients as negative for the biomarker, which means they won't get enrolled in the trial. Okay, so so that's basically the risk that you run. Uh, when you have, again, the algorithm itself is validated. The PICSET score is great. I just have a paper published on this. But when it's applied to a data set that has low dynamic range, it can cause a lot of havoc. I mean, and that's the main take home message that I wanted to say is that the algorithm alone is not the issue. What you analyze it with is also important. So it's something that keep in mind. I think that's pretty much all I have. So, you know, um, the validation is always relative. It's not absolute. It depends really on what you're trying to do. Um, um, you know, I always say this jokingly to my group is that there's no image analysis without images. So if you don't have good data, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out. So really, you know, um, validating your assay is as equally important as validating the algorithm that you're using on your images. Uh, and lastly, you know, the validation is not a one and done thing. Um, no algorithm is perfect. You're always going to find flaws. The question that you always have to ask is, is this good enough for what I'm doing? And and find a way or means by which you can sort of answer that question so that you sort of, you know, complete the, uh, sort of fill that gap. So I think with that, I'd like to stop and thank you all for your attention.